Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jonathan Suhu with Defend Our Future, and we're here to discuss the importance of taking part in our democratic process, including voting, and how you can participate in this election beyond just voting. For those who may not know, Defend Our Future is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering young people of all political persuasions who are interested in advancing climate change and clean energy solutions that grow our economy and protect the world for future generations. In my role at Defend Our Future, I primarily work with our campus ambassadors who are building power in their communities and on campus online. I'm excited to be joined by two of our stellar team members, Kyla Navarro and Carlin Bradley, as well as my co-host, Lily Duffield from EDF Action. Lily? Hi, as Johnson said, my name is Lily Duffield and I work at EDF Action, which is the advocacy partner of the Environmental Defense Fund. We at EDF Action build transformative political power to help protect the environment and the health of American families. We work across the aisle to build political momentum and mobilize constituents to advocate for our health and the environment. We are really excited to partner with Defend Our Future because we want to make real and lasting progress on our efforts to combat climate change. And we can only do this by working with and engaging young people to make sure their voices are heard to shape the future. Thanks, Lily. Um, before we kick things off, I do want to um, let viewers know that they can check out uh, our website at www.defendourfuture.org so you can join our movement, uh, learn how you can register to vote, um, and find out all the other information that we have available for you. Um, so let's get started. Uh, Kyla and Carlin, can you uh, introduce yourselves and share a little bit about the work you're doing with Defend Our Future, uh, particularly during this uh, pandemic? Hello everyone, I'm Kyla Navarro and I'm a first generation college student at New Mexico State University studying um, government and minoring in economics. For I am a Canvas ambassador for Defend Our Future and what we've been doing is just getting people, uh, students in the university ex get excited about being advocates for the planet and trying to get them to register to vote and get informed about what's happening in their community. Um, yes, so my name is Carlin Bradley. I use he, him, they, them pronouns. I'm double majoring in political science and gender and women's studies. I'm at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. I also am the Tucson organizer with Defend Our Future. I actually started out with Defend Our Future last summer as a volunteer and then was a campus ambassador and then now the organizer for Tucson. Thanks, Carlin and Kyla. Um, let's start with you, Carlin. Uh, so, as you, as everyone knows, you know this this year the stakes are really high. So, you know we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, our economy is in tatters, and our country is facing a reckoning over racial injustice. Um, why does voting matter to you? Um, so, I think that one of the things that's really important to remember or to contextualize this question further. I mean, and also my answer is that for a lot of people, um, the stakes in the election have always been high. Um, so like I'm a black person, um, I come from a black family. I have family members who actually like grew up in um, segregation. So like my great grandmother, right? Like grew up in the Jim Crow South. Um, so um, the stake of the elections have always been high for marginalized communities. I think the thing that is different with this election in particular is that the is that because of the pandemic, um, a lot of uh, more people um, who usually the stakes were not high for or who were insulated from some of the ramifications um, of election decisions, they're paying more attention and are being activated in a way that they haven't been before because they are recognizing the, the ways that they are going to be impacted um, by, by the outcome, right? Um, it has been like I said, for a lot of marginalized folks, so not only just Black people, right, um, other BIPOC communities, undocumented people, um, immigrants, right, um, queer people, women, those folks have always had high stakes in elections and have always had to do things to make sure that they were doing as much harm reduction as possible. And now more people are recognizing that they too are in danger 
from what could happen or not in this election. So I think that that's really what is happening in this moment is we're is the pandemic is highlighting all of the different ways that many people have been vulnerable to things. It's just that more of us are now vulnerable than ever. Growing up in the Philippines, um, my dad would always take me to like to vote with him whenever he wanted to vote for any election, whether it's local or bigger national. And coming here to the United States and seeing that people in my age group didn't care as much or wasn't excited as much about like finally getting to vote really was weird for me. And it's just in from my perspective is that looking back in the Philippines, the voting system is sort of like unsure. You're not nothing is really clear and transparent, as I would say here in the United States where there's like you you know and understand that um voting is called is different from every state and so it's quite difficult to um rig it in a sense and so there's just more accountability and in my head i think voting here is so much better and so and you get more of an input than you would back in my home country and so that's why voting matters to me because i I wouldn't be able to have a say or be very confused what if I had stayed back in the Philippines. So would you definitely say, Kyla, that you have a bigger voice um, here in the States? I definitely do because, um, as I mentioned, in the Philippines, you see politicians who... Um, have done wrong like the, the um, news media has revealed that they weren't very honest about what they've done in their power however they are still in that position and they can get re-elected again to a different position and still be in politics and so that's why i really appreciate the system here in the united states <laughs> so there are a lot of misconceptions about why young people don't vote in greater numbers I'd love it if you could talk about some of the challenges of getting young people to vote. I think that um, some of the challenges is the difficulty of understanding like how voting works in the first place. So some people might not understand that certain, um, we pay a lot of attention to federal elections and national elections. However, like in terms of municipal or just state elections, um, they also hold a lot of power. And so, however, um, a lot of people in our peers might not participate in them because they don't get as much coverage through social media or um, how, um, anywhere else. And so I think, I, I think the change is educating people what certain powers are given to the city, to the state, and then to federal. And how certain... Also, um, that certain, they're elected differently depending on where you're at. And so, like, in my county, I believe we have ranked choice voting. And perhaps in other counties or other cities, it's completely different. It's just regular popular vote or, yeah. So I think that's a challenge. <laughs> my next question is, ties into that, you know, voting is obviously important, but it's not the only thing. Um, that people should be doing, right? It's, um, you know, holding our elected officials accountable after elect election day, for example. Um, so how do we do that? Um, no, I did mention that something I really appreciate about being here in the United States is the accountability that you see with politicians. And um, I think that... you people put someone in office and think that it's one and done. However, they do not um, really keep track or keep an eye out for what that politician has done or is doing. Are they going back on their word or are they doing something that they um, that wasn't implicated in the promises that they made when they were on the campaign? and. I think it's difficult in terms of 
one of the challenges is um, some elected officials aren't very um, easy to reach. I know we have social media platforms, but some aren't as savvy as others. And that's maybe due to age or maybe they just try to cater towards, um, I would say, more of the present voting block, which is older people who would call or would write letters instead of being on their phones and like tagging them on Twitter or any other social media platforms. And so I think that it sort of goes back around to that if we show that we come out as a collective to elect certain people that they will accommodate for us in terms of being more transparent. Um, particularly because there's a lot of discourse around just that, right? Um, there are a lot of folks who are like, we should just hold folks accountable after they have been elected. And I think a piece of it is, um, a, I feel like a piece of us starting that is normalizing, holding people accountable while they are running for election, right? I um, mean, I think that we shouldn't have to wait until people are in their elected positions to then and hold them accountable. I think another piece of um, of this too is really recognizing the ways that we don't necessarily know how to hold people accountable because we're unfamiliar with our bureaucratic processes, right? So a lot of people, um, they don't even know who all of their elected officials are. They may, you know, if a lot of people know who the president is, people may know who their um, congressional senators are for their state. They might know who their, um, their like, legislative district, um, congressional district senator is. But a lot of people don't know who their mayor is or who their board of supervisors member is or who their member of the city council is, who their school board member is. Etc. Right there are all of these levels to um, our representative democracy that exists that many of us are unfamiliar with, and then there's the added layer of us not knowing how to interact with the um, with the bureaucratic systems that exist to then even be able to hold our elected uh, elected officials accountable. Right. So if I don't even know who my mayor is, how am I supposed to hold them accountable? If I don't know that you know the mayor and the city council have meetings. And how often they meet, how am I supposed to hold them accountable? And those are the people that are local to us. So the expectation of holding folks that are further away because they are higher up in the um, hierarchical um, bureaucratic structure. So like how, you know, a congressional person or your state senator, um, how are you supposed to hold those folks accountable when they're so much further away and also when they're accountable to so many more people, right? Um, you know, so in Arizona, for example, we have, well, all of the states have two state senators, right? But those two state senators are, they are accountable to every single person in the state. And it's like, how, how do you realistically hold folks accountable when they are accountable to everyone? Um, <laughs> And I think that that, that and I think that that is a piece of the issue is that um, a lot of our elected official uh, elected officials aren't just accountable to us. They're accountable to everyone. And all of the things that we need from them or want from them may not align with each other. And so it's really up to us to understand what it is that we want to need from our elected officials and then being able to figure out, how do we then let, how do we convey to them that this is something that we actually need, that this is something that the community actually wants from you um, and what that looks like. And sometimes that can be writing letters. Sometimes that can be um, visiting and meeting with them in person at their offices. Um, but then that, that becomes so complicated too, because most offices are open during business hours. So if you work or if you're a working class person, um, getting in contact with your representatives can also be challenging because they may not literally be available to you because you work when their office is open. And um, so, yeah, those are some of the things that are complicated about that question and about accountability. Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Um, kind of going back to uh, the subject of young people and getting them to the polls, I'd love to hear what motivates the two of you personally to vote. 
as I mentioned, something that motivates motivates me is that um, it was sort of instilled in me that this is something normal to do, no matter how small the election is. But I would like to share something that happened here in the United States that still motivates me to vote is um, back in the midterm elections, I decided to get a little bit more hands-on and involved in a very contested um, election in my district. And it ended up being very, one of the narrowest um, elections of the midterm with it being decided by like 4,000, less than 4,000 votes for a um, congressional district. And that's, it just tells uh, me that like every vote does count because um, for the person that I was rooting for, it, they didn't finish counting until the very next day. And I was just like holding my breath because they were aware that there was these people who decided to do absentee ballots that they their votes still needed to be counted and that actually put the um representative over um the other and so that's something that motivates me to to vote so i wanted to shift gears a little bit um to talk about the census um so for folks who may not know um this is happening right now. Um, and for those unfamiliar with what it is um, and how important uh, the census is, it's a nationwide counting of every person living uh, in the United States and five te US territories. It provides critical data um, that lawmakers, business owners, teachers, and many others uh, use to provide daily services, products, and support for communities. And every year, billions of dollars uh, in federal funding uh, go to you know, hospitals, fire departments, schools, roads, and other institutions based on census data. Um, the results of the census also determine the number of seats that each state is allotted in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and they are used to draw congressional and state legislative districts. Um, you know, my, myself, I received um, the uh, little the envelope uh, in the mail a few months ago. And, um, you know, during the pandemic, obviously, um, you know, I was, we're all able to fill it out online, um, and that was really quick and easy. Um, so, you know, if folks who are listening, if you haven't done so already, um, you can go to my2020census.gov, and as I mentioned, it's quick and easy. It takes just a few minutes. Um, so just turning back to you, Carla and um, Carlin, what has your experience been um, with the census? Yeah, so... The census happens every 10 years. So I think this year was like, I think the first time that I actually filled the census out because the, fir the first time that it happened when I was old enough to vote, I wasn't really familiar with it. Um, so I don't remember if I did fill it out or not. I'm pretty sure I didn't. My mom may have done it though. Um, and so this year though, I know I knew a lot more about the census. Um, I was listening to NPR, for example, and they were talking about some of the some of the challenges that they were having um, about getting folks to fill out the census. So the the um, the station I was listening to, so I'm from Southern California, and so I was listening to the California NPR station, and they were talking about um, at Fresno, which is in the Central Valley, and how they were having a hard time having um, either like undocumented folks or mixed status families filling out the census because people were concerned about the government like collecting information. They were concerned about people from the government coming to their homes, asking them questions um, about themselves. And so I think that that's another piece of the, um, the complication of the census information as well is that there are people who are concerned um, about the government. And so they what they were trying to do though in California was really get people from the community to go out into the community and to inform people and be like, this isn't like, this has nothing to do with immigration. This had like your information will be safe. Um, this will this will actually, um, in theory, um, help with things um, if we can get an accurate count of folks. Um, 
And one of the other things that I know about the census too now is that because the way that we get information has transformed in the last decade, um, there there are a lot more campaigns and there are there is a lot more awareness around like what the census is, how you fill it out, when you're able to do it, and like what it does. And I definitely know know more about it now because of those things. My experience with the census, so I, I came to the United States roughly 10, 11 years ago. And so that was um, sort of my first experience was a year into my time here. And the adults in my household, I remember clearly they said that this wasn't something to fill out. And it was just, they were very skeptical about putting their information on, I believe, income household or household income and giving it to the government and so on. And so I had for the longest time, this also the same idea that like, oh yeah, the government doesn't need to know my information until um, I believe Carlin touched on it on like your access to information these days, you know, you can just run into an infographic saying what actually the census is and that's very helpful. And that's why this year I was very like, I'm not gonna let my mom get the envelope. Like I'll do it myself and like make sure that my family is counted. And I also wanted to say that Carlin touched on something very important about the census. And I am in Southern New Mexico where it is a predominantly Hispanic community. And a lot of, um, specifically my, one of my friends actually just called me about um, census people knocking at his door and, um, him being very, um, like his mother has raised him to not answer the door to people claiming they're from the government or anything like that. And so there's these immigrant communities who are very apprehensive about the government knowing their status. And the census does not um, include the citizenship question, which we're very grateful for. Um, but I think that's something that we need to do is sort of break these preconceived notions about um, get giving information. Everybody needs to be counted. It's like been the census has been done since like the United States has been founded. I, I think that's like a really cool tidbit that this is a normal thing that we do every decade. And so. So some of the reasons why folks don't necessarily feel comfortable participating in the census is because um, people who are undocumented specifically have very good reasons to be fearful um, of the government collecting information about them. Um, and I think that that even ties to, so I'll, I'll bring it back here locally to my state, right? So I live in Arizona. One of the things that we have here we had the bill SB 1070, which allowed for non-federal agencies to act out right, immigration policies, right? So I think that when people, when communities are talking about being nervous about the government collecting information about their documentation status, or even just nervous about folks coming to their homes um, and them not knowing who they are, or them being federal agencies, there is, there is lived experience in that fear because the state has been a bad actor in those regards like folks have been taken and detained and deported um because people have knocked on their doors and detained them right um and we have again agencies that aren't federal agencies working in conjunction with like ice um and border patrol coming to people's homes and deporting them so i really and it, so it is this really hard balance because on one hand, I think, on one hand, yes, it would be wonderful for us to have accurate numbers of the number of undocumented people that we have um, to hopefully then push for better policy change. But on the other hand, historically, we have seen that we don't treat immigrants and migrants very good in our country um, legislatively. And particularly in these last 20 years when it has become, um, where we have turned to this much more punitive way of dealing with um, undocumented folks with, by um, arresting, deporting, and deporting them, right, um, the folks. And so I think that we have to remember that when people are fearful of the state, 
it's usually because it's rooted in a history of some type of violence being acted out by the state. Like they're not just making these things up. They're not blowing things out of proportion. There are lived experiences that back up that very legitimate fear. I can give a little answer to this as well. Um, I guess for me, it's always been impressed that everyone fills out the census because even though it seems like just a survey, um, there could be major consequences if people don't, um, especially environmentally. Um, so like without the census, we are not able to deploy help where it's needed when most extreme weather that is fueled by climate change devastates our communities. Uh, we also use the census data to do risk assessments that consider the health impacts of new facilities on nearby communities when permits are being granted for polluters. And this data won't be accurate without the census, which puts us all at risk. Um, and also, if people don't fill it out, we won't really have a fair and accurate representation, which we need to accurately assess the best interest of Americans and pass legislation we need to get a zero pollution future. Plus, the census is conducted only every 10 years, uh, which Carolyn, you mentioned, which means that inaccurate data could be disastrous for many communities for a long time. So maybe it would help people a little bit to quell their fears and answer some of their questions if they knew more about the physical process of voting. Um, what would you suggest people do to get more involved in the 2020 elections? I thought that something something that could excite people is getting involved in a campaign, whether it's um, for a city representative or a state representative. I think that um, being sort of where the action is can kind of get you excited to um, being part of the election process. And another thing that's an issue now with the pandemic is the um, worries that states and also just counties have with um, poll workers. They're worried that they might not have enough poll stations because they won't have enough people um, being able to run them. Usually poll workers are retirees and so they are at most are most at risk in terms of COVID and I think that's um, something to think about is younger people also participating in as being a poll worker, it is a paid position. So something to consider. <laughs> yeah. And especially when you're talking about, you know, challenges that, you know, people, you know, across the spectrum face, but particularly young people, you know, you gave the example of, you know, even though, you know, their campuses are doing better, you know, and trying to establish, you know, polling stations, young people still don't turn out, you know, at the same level, um, as um, other generations do. Um, why do you think that is? And, you know, are there ways of, you know, encouraging other young people to actually turn out? Yeah, so I kind of, I feel like I touch on it um, a little bit about how they didn't really grow up seeing that voting might impact their um, lives. And, you know, they just hear about it, but you know, it's not really taught by their household or the schools. And I think that's a problem. Um, Carlin mentioned his one semester civics class in high school, and I also had to take one. But I and I noticed that people weren't engaged. It was during actually the 2016 election when you have very, um, it, it was sort of like unprecedented to have these two candidates and they were still not engaged. And not to mention during that service class, um, I think that, you know, the public education system hasn't been very well for them because I, we, my teacher decided to give us the citizenship exam, which is, you know, basic um, tests about like, who's the speaker of the house, president, vice president, so on. And I believe I was the only one who passed it and everyone else did not get the like passing score to be a citizen, basically. And I think that's really tells us that, um, you know, the public education system does not um, allow us to, or teach students and these um, basically the new generation and how to participate in the political process. And yeah, that's all I have. Sharing my, you know, I'm trying to think back in high school when I had, you know, AP government, and it was basically one of the only civic classes that I took in high school. 
And I can just remember, you know, I was, I think back then I was, you know, had some interest in government politics in general, but I just remember it was basically, I had to take it on myself to learn more than simply the history of the presidents or the American presidency or how Congress works. Um, so I think, you know, there's definitely a huge gap in between education um, and, you know, basically explaining to people like almost like what we're doing right now of, yes, it is important and this is why. And it, it do, it's more than just learning the history books um, because you're living it right now. Um, so I guess, Lily, if you want, I want to start this. Oh. So, Lily, um, people are voting right now uh, in the middle of the pandemic. What's different and what's being done to safeguard public health and our democracy? Yeah, so this is a really great question. Um, our lives have obviously been turned upside down by the coronavirus, and it is no different with our elections. Uh, I think, Carlin, I think you mentioned this a little bit as well, but in the Georgia and Wisconsin primaries, we saw how much this crisis can impact our elections um, with long lines and fewer polling locations, which meant fewer poll workers. And now for the general election, we've heard from the post office that vote by mail ballots need to be sent out two weeks prior to arrive in time. Um, that's why we need to make sure that our states have the resources they need to hold safe and secure elections in November. In fact, the House has already passed billions in funding for the states, and now it's time for the Senate to follow suit in an upcoming COVID-19 stimulus package. Uh, this comprehensive funding would be a pretty good way to honor the late Congressman John Lewis and his lifelong fight to secure and protect every citizen's right to vote. And it would ensure that even in a pandemic, we have the ability to fulfill this civic duty. Um, all these efforts would allow voters the ability to cast a ballot for the person they believe will stand up best for their community. Um, so I know that there are, um, I'm like, that's a, that's a big question. So I know that some of the things that are happening is that a lot of folks are voting by mail. So like, for example, I live in Arizona again, in Arizona, we do have um, the ability to vote by mail. I'm on the permanent early voter list. And that is how I plan to vote in the election is by using um, the permanent early voter list. I know that there um, are, there, there are campaigns where if your state does have the permanent early voter list for folks to get registered on there. So a lot of organizations um, are trying to get as many people as possible to use that as an option and to like share information about here's what that looks like. Um, and then there are people that will still want to go vote in person. There are people who they really just like that experience of going to the poll. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, what kinds of things are being done in order to make sure that like people are safe. So I don't, you know, around like making sure that people have face coverings and making sure that people are social distancing when they're in line um, or if they can't, that they do have their coverings because they will be, you know, um, standing with one another. I'm not familiar with what is going on with that because I don't do, I don't do poll working. Um, so I'm not, and I don't have a lot of um, contact with folks who do poll working either. So I'm not entirely, I'm not sure on the ends of like, in-person voting, what are some of the steps are being taken in order to ensure that folks who do choose to go um, vote in person are able to do so safely. Thank you, Carlin. Um, I just want to thank, you know, everyone. I think this is a wrap, but um, I want to thank all the folks who are watching us with us today. Um, you know, we talked a lot about a lot of heavy topics, you know, including, you know, disenfranchising voters, the disenfranchisement of voters, you know, the challenges that we face on election day, um, but also, you know, the, um, the real, um, I think the real challenge of, you know, getting our elected leaders to listen to us, you know, even, you know, after the polls close. Um, and I think one of my key takeaways from this conversation is that, you know, we have a lot of work to do and you know this conversation can't end today it can't end on election day right um you know we have to continue to have these conversations and not just have conversations but action um and so yeah i just want to thank you know you carlin and Car kyla and lily and ed of action for for joining joining us today um i just wanted to go around and um you know hear from 
from you all, you know, your key takeaways from today's conversation. Um, we want to start um, with you, Carlin. Um, so my key takeaways, I have a few of them. One of them being that when we are having conversations about voting, we always have to remember that they need to be nuanced conversations. Um, so remembering that things like voter suppression did not just start in 2020. Um, voter suppression has been a state in our electoral process. That's why some of the things like the Voter Protection Act exist, right? Because voter suppression is a thing um, that has historically existed and that when we are talking about voting, we have to keep that in mind and not just um, cherry pick if and when and how it happens because it has been consistently happening. Um, I think that one of the other things we have to keep in mind too is that voting is very nuanced. It is complicated and there are no simple solutions or answers to a multitude of the um, the the issues that we have discussed even today around voting and to keep that in mind when we are having conversations they have to be critical they have to be nuanced they should be intersectional as well um, and the last thing is is that we um, as folks who are interested in doing like this kind of civic engagement work that we really should and need to keep open minds about if and how and when people participate in the electoral process. Some people don't want to. And I think that um, we need to provide the space for that, um, for those folks, because there are a lot of reasons why people don't participate in the electoral process. We want to know for some of those reasons in this conversation today. And shaming people um, about their truths isn't gonna move them to participating. Yes, and I would have to agree with Carlin. I like um, this um, having discussions with people who don't come from the same background as I do, as either less or more privileged than I do. Hearing their experiences and seeing where we connect and where we are like completely different, you know. And I think that's really important when it comes to um, talking about voting because. I haven't experienced, um, again, um, a lot, I haven't had a lot of experience in terms of political process because um, I have barely entered it in a sense. And so I think hearing from others and like, and seeing what the solutions can be in terms of expanding people's um, right to vote, whether it's through um, extending early voting or making election day more accessible by having it a federal holiday, things like that, I think. So definitely having more conversations. Yeah, so I kind of agree with you, Jonathan. I think my biggest takeaway was that we have a lot of work to do and that everyone comes from a different background in a different area and no two voters are the same. And so we need to really listen to people and to really air out their grievances and, you know, hear their fears and allow them to speak on those and to make them valid. Um, but basically that we have a lot of work to do. Great. Um, and I forgot to ask all of you, um, like, where can we find you online? Um, so I, I have a Twitter. It's just Jonathan underscore suhu <laughs> that you can find me at how about we go around again and share where folks can follow um some of the places you can find me on social media if you want to follow me on facebook it's my name carlin bradley that's k-a-r-l-y-n my last name is bradley b-r-a-d-l-e-y and then you can follow me on twitter my twitter handle is at dontre1224 that's D A. W N T R A Y one two two four. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter or Instagram, it's Kyla Ren. It's a pun on Star Wars, yay! Um, <laughs> and I made a little graphic, so there's just a little subtlety because on Instagram, Kyla Ren was taken, so I put a little period on it. <laughs> oh my god, that's really smart, Kyla. I wish I had done that. Um, but if you want to follow me, I am on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is pretty simple. It's just at Lily underscore Duffield, and that's L-I-L-Y underscore D-U-F-F-I-E-L-D. Great, great. Um, and I'll, I'll just make a final plug for Defend Our Future. Um, 
So we're, we're also at, on Twitter and Instagram at Defend Our Future. And on Facebook, we're at, at Defend Our Future Challenge. Um, so, yeah. So if you want to you know, check out what we're doing, you can also visit our website at, at defendourfuture.org. Um, and lastly, you know, we're still encouraging people to register to vote um, and to participate in the census. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.